Hello, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be able to address this uh, very uh, prestigious audience. I'm going to be discussing uh, our vision about the accelerated computing and storage data access for the age of AI. And uh, I am a senior distinguished research scientist and senior director of research at NVIDIA Corporation. Uh, before I joined NVIDIA in 2020, uh, I was a professor at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and uh, I was a fa on faculty at the university for 33 years before I moved to NVIDIA. And uh, uh, this is a standard disclaimer. Uh, the views expressed in this con uh, the content belong to me and my colleague collaboration uh, later, meaning uh, all the all my students and my uh, collaboration uh, researchers, but uh, not uh, Nvidia is affiliates or employees. So the, uh, I'd like to start with the uh, you know the data intensive AI access patterns that we're seeing in the field today. Um, we're beginning to see a very important shift of AI uh, models in, uh, in the field. Uh, in the previous uh, decade or so, started in 2012, uh, the AI activities are uh, focused or centered around uh, models. These models are trained with massive amount of data and uh, the models are used to, uh, to uh, perform in inference uh, during the, uh, the AI uh, application use. However, uh, in the past five years or so, uh, we begin to realize, as a field, uh, realize that uh, these models have uh, a lot of uh, deficiencies. The most important deficiency is that these models are statistical a summary of the uh, the data that are uh, being uh, that are used in the training. However, uh, during inference, uh, because of the statistical nature, sometimes when the query come in, uh, the, the model can have a phenomenon called the hallucination. And this is because of the statistical nature of um, combining data, and sometimes the uh, the model will create information that is not really in individual data, but in some kind of strange statistical combination of the data, which is, does not reflect reality. Therefore, uh, we have a, a very strong push in the field to uh, incorporate real data and knowledge in the inference. And uh, here uh, on the left-hand side, I show that the, the query into a, uh, a model such as ChatGPT4 and that the model will be uh, broken into two uh, two parts. One is the encoding, and one is the generator uh, encoder, and one is the generator. So the on the gener uh, encoder side, the query will be encoded into uh, embeddings, and the embeddings will be used by a retriever, which is a new component into a knowledge base. And the knowledge base is can be of a wide variety of um, of uh, nature. One is uh, what we call the expert knowledge base. And these knowledge, the knowledge base could be in legal or different uh, fields of the law or medicine and the different fields of medicine, or uh, it could also be general, meaning that uh, this, uh, the knowledge base could incorporate all the knowledge and the material that a uh, ordinary person going through kindergarten through uh, the 12th grade would learn and perhaps with the, what we call the general liberal college education. And the, uh, such knowledge will be used to, uh, to the, as a, what we call the guardrail context uh, into the uh, inference process and uh, along with the query into the pre-trained uh, large language model on the right-hand side and uh, before we uh, derive the answer. With the real data and knowledge as guardrail, as the context, the inference can become uh, much more stable, much more real, uh, uh, much more uh, re uh, realistic, and uh, hallucination. So the and uh, this kind of retrieval will involve um, what we call the uh, this retrieval is called the uh, retrieval aug augmented generation in the field, and the data can range easily from ten terabytes to one petabyte. And the, we, the access pattern is to be able to select 
the relevant, uh, what we call the rows and columns of the tabular format uh, in the knowledge storage. And um, oftentimes we will need to use quite a bit of compute to be able to find the, uh, the correct uh, or the appropriate uh, pieces of the knowledge from the database. Another important uh, category of data access is the graph data access. In real world, uh, things, uh, all the uh, entities and activities are all related to each other, and graphs are used to represent such relationship. And um, so, for example, um, when we look at a, uh, any of the commercial transactions, the credit card, for example, uh, the credit card, each credit card transaction would involve uh, banks, would involve consumers, would involve merchants, and uh, it would also involve uh, different uh, types of intermediate settlement uh, agency. And all these entities will, uh, will uh, form nodes in a graph, and these graphs can be extremely large. And, um, uh, and then uh, each node will have properties. So, for example, each consumer will have income, age, uh, you know, the previous um, purchase patterns and travel patterns and so on. And such information is important during the transaction to be able to detect fraud uh, in real time. And the fraud is a billion dollar uh, kind of uh, uh, damage to the, uh, to, to the business every year. And there's a very high value to be able to detect for fraud accurately uh, without the false alarm, and the graphs are the, probably the, uh, currently the, the best uh, candidate for the next generation fraud detection. And uh, such graphs can be um, you know, easily uh, varying from about 10 gigabytes to 100 terabytes. So the, uh, these, uh, the, the most important data access in this uh, paradigm is the node features. And uh, uh, these node features are uh, also stored in uh, tabular format. So understanding uh, how we can, uh, how these access patterns work and how we can support this kind of access pattern on a uh, very large, massive uh, the, uh, number and uh, reasonable cost is going to be critical for the success of applying AI to, uh, to, the, uh, to the real applications uh, in the coming uh, decade. So the, uh, I would like to uh, show you a little bit about the, how the current data access work and the, how well we are supporting such access in the field today. And uh, this is a, uh, a measurement that we took uh, when GPU, uh, a GPU is used to ac accelerate data frame access. Uh, the data frames are the uh, the primary um, storage format for uh, for the data that I showed in the previous slide, and um, uh, this is a uh, a simple query processing for New York taxi uh, uh, drive uh, uh, taxi uh, data set, and um, uh, so, so it uh, is actually uh, less uh, you know the, uh, less demanding than uh, the previous two, but it's simpler so that it's easier to show the point. However, the observation applies directly to the, um, to the uh, data set for retrieval augmented uh, uh, genera uh, generation and the, uh, the graph and the uh, neural networks analytics. So the, uh, when we access such a uh, data set, we will be accessing pieces of data uh, from the data frame storage. So I showed that uh, in, the, uh, in the picture, uh, there are uh, you know, the, what we call the row groups, which are the pieces that we're ac accessing from the data frame. And the first row group is gonna take more time because there are systems set up and so on. So that we will, we will uh, skip that and look at the subsequent uh, the, uh, segments that we access, for example, row group two. And uh, uh, when we look at the detailed uh, timing of accessing uh, the subsequent groups, we see that uh, uh, there is a very interesting breakdown of the time uh, that are spent in the different activities for serving this uh, request. 95% of the time uh, for each row group in this GPU accelerated uh, access to the data frame is spent in IO service and memory management running on the CPU. 
And um, so, and only less than 5% of the time is actually spent on processing the data uh, once the data arrives in the GPU. And uh, uh, this is, I showed the uh, percent, uh, the portion of the time that is actually uh, spent on the GPU. And as we can see that uh, this is a, uh, a very unfortunate situation where the overhead to prepare the data uh, for GPU execution accounts for the vast majority of the time uh, in processing uh, and accessing this data set. So the, what's, uh, what caused the problem that we're seeing in the, uh, in the previous slide is the, uh, it can be illustrated with a, a simple cartoon uh, illustration. So this is, you know, the, uh, I took the previous slide and um, uh, use a kind of a cartoon to explain uh, what what happened that uh, in the past two decades that led to the observations that we're seeing today. Uh, two, about uh, 20 years ago, uh, if we uh, execute the same uh, queries uh, or accesses, we will see something like the top portion of the, uh, the graph. Each, data, uh, uh, each row group will be accessed by starting with operating system and file system uh, service code. And uh, so we will do a system call and then we, uh, the operating system file system will execute and then uh, and, uh, determine that it needs to go down to the driver uh, to access the data. And then the yellow part, uh, the orange part is the, uh, the storage uh, the, the devices such as uh, disk, and today it's, uh, we're, uh, we're mostly moving into solid state disks. The median access into the disk and the controller portion will uh, account for the uh, orange part. And then uh, the data will com uh, come back and there will be operating system and file system processing time to, uh, to actually get the data into the, um, in, into the compute device memory. And then eventually the application will uh, process the data. So the, this, uh, this, uh, this process will repeat uh, for the following uh, the, uh, uh, row groups. So the, uh, as we can see, the, uh, the me uh, storage median access time orange and the application processing time green are big enough to hide most of the system uh, operating system and file system processing time. However, what happened in the past 20 years is that the applications have uh, been drastically accelerated by devices like GPU. As you can see in the previous slide, the actual query processing is extremely, extremely fast and a very, very short amount of time is needed to process that query on the GPU. And uh, this is to the credit of so many engineers and uh, product generations that uh, led to the dramatic uh, acceleration of the application portion. And also the storage devices actually have been improving uh, behind the scenes in the past 20 years as we move from, uh, from the old uh, hard drive technology into the SSD and then we, you know, we moved from the old access protocol into the NVMe protocol. And now we have even faster protocol in the making. So the, these, uh, the storage device and protocols have been drastically accelerated. However, the operating system and file system services running in the CPU kernel mode has have not been accelerated uh, significantly due to various technological constraints, especially uh, the one of the major factors is that the, the operating system uh, running in the kernel mode cannot use many of the features, in, including vector processing and so on uh, in the modern processors. So today, if we look at the, uh, the, the execution time, uh, most of the time is actually in, uh, spent in the operating system file system, and therefore uh, we saw the real measurement in the previous slide. And uh, uh, the, in the near future, there will be further acceleration of storage devices. We already have seen um, you know, the very, very nice improvements from Micron and Samsung and so, and so on and, Pi, uh, and uh, Fison that um, uh, the, the uh, storage access time will be further reduced. And um, uh, in the near future, we will uh, have 
most of the uh, the processing time of data access, uh, this data access and processing in the system, operating system and file system service. And this is a classic manifestation of the MDOS law. Um, so the uh, right now, the, the percentage, there's a very significant percentage of time spent in the operating system and file system. Unfortunately, uh, most of the industry efforts that uh, we have been spending in the, 20, the past 20 years and the next couple of years are in the application side and the storage side. Therefore, uh, the further improvement that we can make by further accelerating applications and storage devices will be extremely limited and uh, that's exactly what is being uh, stated in the MDOS law. So, the, um, in industry, we already know that um, uh, you know this uh, the operating system and file system is uh, too slow to be able to keep up with the application needs and the storage devices, uh, uh, application uh, acceleration. Therefore, uh, currently, uh, in uh, for GPUs at uh, NVIDIA, for example, uh, produced by NVIDIA. We uh, we have uh, engineering efforts to avoid uh, making storage accesses. So what we do is that uh, we uh, we uh, we uh, is shown in this picture. So the the storage contains all that data in the let's say in the data frame formats, and but the uh, the storage data is opaque to applications except for memory map files, and the uh, the the most prominent way of processing large amount of data is for the application to preload uh, the, the contents from the file system and databases into the collected uh, or what we call the pooled GPU memory and uh, uh, shown on the left hand side. And um, uh, so uh, once the data is loaded into the memory, then uh, it can be accessed as data structures and code so that uh, uh, we can operate and uh, on, uh, on the code uh, using applications. So the, in this way, we uh, only in, uh, incur the operating system and file system service at the beginning of the application. And then uh, uh, we spend some time to tra transfer the data uh, in the orange into the memory. And then we just keep just Keep cracking on the, uh, you know, the uh, cracking the cram on the, the data and keep processing the data in the memory and bypass all the operating system services and uh, uh, and the uh, database services. So this is a, the reason. Uh, this is exactly the uh, the paradigm we're using for training large language models today. Um, so. It, as we move forward, uh, we're going to begin to have a large number of applications that will be doing inference. And these inferences no longer have a very long training time. Uh, training a large language model takes weeks of time on thousands of GPUs. And um, so the, uh, that, that, uh, with that kind of uh, you know, the, uh, period of time, it's worth preloading the data into the memory and then just keep accessing data in the memory. However, uh, for inference, each inference will last for only milliseconds. So the, and uh, preloading data into the, uh, you know, into the memory uh, would uh, be much, much uh, more costly and uh, less effective uh, as a model. So the, I'm showing a, a simple calculation. Uh, if we preload the data into the memory pool, uh, it will be worthwhile if the initial preload cost plus all the accesses, uh, access costs in the memory is much smaller than accessing the data from the storage. So the left-hand side is the, uh, the cost for preloading and accessing in, uh, through, in memory, and then the right-hand side uh, is the, uh, the access from the storage all the time. And um, uh, however, uh, in the inference application, in, in the, uh, the, uh, the AI, uh, you know, the new AI applications, that the graph applications and so on we're seeing, the, uh, the access to the data is much more sparse than the, uh, the training process. And therefore, uh, it's actually uh, not uh, not necessarily a, a good idea to preload all that data into the uh, into the memory. And more importantly, 
uh, the memory pool approach makes uh, uh, very expensive for uh, massive data sets. So the, uh, it, it very, very few applications can afford having thousands of GPUs uh, pull together the memory just to be able to support uh, these uh, inferences. So there is an alternative approach in the field, and it's actually being used uh, by uh, people who cannot afford to pull together thousands of GPUs uh, to process these massive data sets. It's, like, it's called the memory map file access through page fault handling. So the, the way that this me uh, mechanism work is uh, we start from the GPU on the lower uh, left uh, uh, corner, where the GPU threads uh, will access uh, a uh, virtual memory map uh, data. And then uh, the data, because the data is in the storage, it's going to, uh, it's not gonna be able to find the data in the memory, so it's gonna uh, trigger page fault. And then the page fault will uh, actually uh, go to the CPU, and the CPU will uh, further uh, process the page fault and bring that piece of data into the GPU. And uh, this is a, uh, a, a, a classic mechanism for uh, people to access uh, data that's uh, beyond the, uh, the memory size. However, for uh, massive data sets, uh, the, this approach can be extremely slow because uh, the, the CPU software stack is not equipped to be able to process these page faults at the rate at which the data really needs to be accessed by the applications in our uh, uh, in the AI generation. So the CPU overhead would uh, definitely limit the performance and often GPUs PCIe bandwidth is not even close, uh, 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 close to be saturated, meaning that the hardware resources that will be able to bring the data into the GPU is, full, is underutilized. And this uh, bandwidth is already orders of magnitude lower than the memory bandwidth of the GPU. Therefore, the whole approach will be just way too slow to be practical uh, for the uh, for for real applications. So the, this is the reason why uh, my research group at uh, uh, Illinois started to uh, to develop a new generation of uh, service data access service technology uh, since uh, 2015 at the University of Illinois. And uh, so we built a uh, in collaboration with IBM and Nvidia, uh, we built a, a new software stack. And uh, we enable the GPUs to be able to uh, an autonomously request data from the storage bypassing the CPU software stack, and, uh, and uh, which is the uh, major bottleneck. And then we leverage the GPU memory and optimize uh, storage bandwidth utilization by having an extremely fast parallel uh, a memory management mechanism, uh, which we call the software cache. And uh, finally, we uh, make the, the, uh, the, the, the data set visible to the users through a uh, array-like abstraction. So the application uh, that doesn't even uh, need to worry about the data, but it just acts as a very, very large array. On the other, uh, just like the memory map I.O., however, uh, that, uh, large ac that access to a large array gets uh, mapped in C++ into a piece of code that access the software cache and, um, uh, and uh, go, go through all the services uh, in the user mode without going through the kernel. So with them, the GPU threads can directly request data where it is, be it in memory, someone else's memory, or storage. So the, uh, I'm not going to go into the, uh, the details, but for those who are uh, more technically oriented, I'll just briefly talk about how it actually works uh, in the GPU. For BAM, uh, what happens in the application is that the data array access uh, will, uh, will uh, be implemented as an offset calculation and then uh, do what we call the warp level coalescing to make sure that we capture situations where uh, the threads access neighboring uh, pieces of data. And then uh, uh, only one uh, thread will uh, need to represent all the other threads to access the cache if they access neighboring pieces of data. And uh, if the, uh, if the uh, data is hit in the uh, access is hit in the cache, then uh, the access uh, is successful and the thread will continue to execute. If the, uh, the, uh, the data is missing from the cache, then uh, the thread will uh, 
go into a library uh, mode and uh, uh, go into a library and uh, prepare the I.O. command and submit the command. And then uh, the storage controller or the services would uh, uh, do the service and uh, come back with the data. And the original thread will wait for the completion and then uh, clean up uh, some of the data and then update the cache state and then uh, continue execution. So the, if we look at the, uh, the performance of this mechanism, uh, the button red is uh, the previous technology uh, that, uh, uh, that was used for GPUs to access uh, large storage data through the page fault handling mechanism. And this was published in ASP, uh, ASP Plus 2013. And um, uh, the upside, uh, uh, upper end is the new uh, BAM technology, as you can see, the, the effective bandwidth that we can have out of the uh, out, uh, accessing the data is you know, the, is dramatically uh, better than the uh, the page fault handling mechanism, and um, so the, this allows us to be able to uh, to access the massive amount of data at the speed that uh, we, the applications really need, and um, uh, so whenever there's a cache miss, uh, we're able to uh, to submit all the requests to the storage devices also uh, you know, the, at least 10 times faster than the uh, previous technology. So the, uh, how, how do we really achieve this? We use what we call the, uh, we use the parallelism to tolerate storage access latency. As we know, the storage accesses have hundreds of microseconds or even millisecond latency. So the most of the uh, the uh, previous uh, CPU based software stacks could not tolerate such latency because they don't have enough parallelism. And the, the parallelism uh, needed to tolerate latency is governed by what we call the Little's Law, which was already uh, or originally uh, 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 designed to cover retail, calculating the retail space needed to create certain level of business. However, uh, it, it uh, applies exactly uh, uh, to the uh, to this kind of uh, you know, storage access uh, situation. So, the, uh, the, if we want to be able to deliver certain rate at uh, data uh, from the storage device at certain rate, such as the uh, the rate allowed by the PCIe uh, or the interconnect uh, the, the bandwidth, uh, for example, for the uh, uh, Gen 4 technology, if we want to uh, access data at 512 byte uh, granularity, uh, we, uh, we, we can take the 25 gigabyte per second bandwidth of the PCIe and divide it by 512 byte uh, the, uh, uh, delivery. And that gives us the rate at which we want to have the data delivered into the GPU, which is 50 million deliveries. And uh, uh, in order to, uh, to be able to sustain 50 million deliveries, for a, a Samsung uh, you know, data center level SSD today, uh, we will need to be able to uh, have 1,500 pending accesses at any moment in time during the time when we want to be able to sustain such delivery. In the previous software stacks, there's uh, you know the they, people were not able to get anywhere close to the 1,500 uh, you know, the uh, pending accesses. Uh, uh, from the uh, application software through the uh, through the system stack. However, through BAN, we're able to achieve this on a uh, you know, regular basis. So here's a, a, a simple evaluation of the uh, 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 of the uh, technology. So we uh, we built a uh, a uh, prototype system based on a uh, the Supermicro uh, so, uh, server box plus a H3 platform uh, PCIe based uh, 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 SSD uh, uh, SSD uh, uh, box. And uh, uh, we can place the GPU either in the uh, sto uh, data storage box or in the server box. And then we can evaluate how fast uh, the data can be accessed from the SSDs into the, uh, into the GPU. So we took the, uh, the, uh, the Amazon DGL library that is uh, you know, the, the, uh, the leading library for uh, training and inferencing on the uh, graphic uh, graph neural networks. Um, we use the, uh, the previous approach that is uh, based on the uh, page faulting mechanism. And then we uh, uh, created a new DGL load data loader 
and incorporated uh, the uh, BAM mechanism into the uh, DGL uh, library. And this is called uh, GIDS today, and uh, it's being upstream uh, into, the, uh, into the DGL library. And uh, this mechanism is uh, for large data sets, uh, this uh, the regular uh, large uh, graphs, this mechanism is probably only about uh, you know, one, uh, 1.5 to two times faster. However, when it comes to the uh, very large, in what we call the industry scale data sets, um, this mechanism can be 20, 30 times faster or even more than 100 times faster compared to the previous technology. So, uh, let me just conclude by saying that the, you know, why we really uh, we are pushing so hard on the technology. Um, you know, if we're successful, uh, we envision that in the next decade, uh, we will enable pervasive use of knowledge base in future AI inferences. Uh, AI inferences. Uh, we will be able to support millisecond latency for uh, retrieval augmented uh, generate, uh, generation uh, in AI query processing. And uh, we can uh, you know, support these kind of uh, you know, inferences uh, by uh, in, uh, uh, with a hundred times or more reduction in cost, and uh, meaning the hardware and energy costs required to be able to execute these queries. Well, why is that important? Uh, the first ones are what I mentioned in the uh, in the uh, opening. Uh, we need to guard against influence hallucination, and also the, uh, we need to provide reference and source for proper explanation, verification, and credit. And this is so important in tomorrow's economy where all the people who, uh, you know, who are contributing to the uh, generated AI results to, to receive proper credit and proper, probably even royalty uh, from their work. And then uh, we want to be able to make high quality AI inference affordable uh, to the mass so that uh, we can make the AI advantage available to everyone except for only the, uh, the most privileged, um, you know, the corporations and so on. So the, uh, there are many, many future directions that, uh, that uh, we will need to uh, you know, cover in order to uh, make these kind of technology truly fruitful. Uh, one is we need to, uh, we, can, uh, we will enable uh, many of our partners such as Meta and uh, Amazon and Microsoft to be able to create new AI capabilities based on enabled by the fast access to the massive data sets. And we are uh, you know, doing accelerate, uh, we're uh, investigating accelerators for data access and movement. Uh, we're optimizing, specializing caching and buffer management. We have storage devices that, does, uh, that supports finer grain, gather, scatter efficiently. And uh, uh, now we need to have improved IO and network protocols for parallelism. Uh, uh, we, we're uh, building multi-GPU, multi-node support for scalability, and we're had, uh, looking at GPU architecture innovations to, uh, to uh, even better support BAM with even higher performance and lower, uh, lower cost, and file system cloud infrastructure support to allow the user to uh, allow the user level services, parallel services to be able to uh, operate in more secure and uh, efficient way and the security isolation when accessing data using user level services in general. And this concludes the uh, talk, and thank you very much uh, for uh, listening to this presentation.